we want to thank you all for coming out this, this uh, evening. It's so exciting to have a bunch of librarians in the same place at the same time. Uh, my name is Stephen, and I work at the American School of Milan, and I also help uh, learning, too, with their technology. And um, this came about because at our conferences, we typically have what are called threads, which are kind of like job alikes, but people coming together have it with the same kind of topic or idea that they want to discuss. And we put them in the same room and discuss. Now, typically, there's not a presenter in the room. There's not an expert in the room. We are all experts in our fields, and we come together to share our expertise. And that's uh, a kind of the model that we have with these threads here tonight as well. So tonight, we have a couple of guiding questions, which, with the help of my librarians at the American School of Milan, Angela and Robin, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, we came up with some guiding questions. But we're also going to have time for you guys just to have some discussion and bring up some questions on your own. Keep in mind that tonight we also we are recording this event. So afterwards, we will provide you the link, including the chat. So the chat is an amazing feature as well. If you want to throw links or have conversation with, in the chat, feel free to do that. And it will be available to you tomorrow. Uh, well, as soon as possible, let me, let me <laughs> as soon as we can. Sometimes it's not uh, that fast to turn around. Are you are staying up late tonight, are you, no, Stephen? That's usually my fault too. Um, and because we have so many people in the room, which is fantastic, what we're going to do is we are going to have a protocol in that um, if you know how to use the hand raising feature with the Zoom, feel free to use that hand raising feature when you have something to add. Um, I'm not going to scold anybody for speaking out either, but uh, with a lot of people, we want to make sure everyone has their voice heard and uh, gets, gets to be part of the conversation, which I'm sure is going to be amazing. And this actually came around using, um, with the help of my librarians at the American School of Milan, who are Angela and Robin, wave Angela and Robin, who are the amazing librarians that I have. And in discussion for the conversation tonight, we were thinking, what would librarians want to talk about? And this idea of libraries being the hearts of our schools, which it very much is, it's that usually at the center of the school. And when I go to visit another school, I usually say first, can I see your library? Because it's always the most amazing place to be on campus. And so we wanted to bring you all together to have a conversation around some uh, guiding questions to allow you to kind of explore that and you know reconnect with some librarians now that you've maybe been stuck at home for a little bit to kind of talk about the impact that uh, lockdowns and COVID-19 have had on your schools. And um, we'll take the conversation from there. Does anybody have, before we get started, does anybody have any questions or concerns about what we've talked about so far? Excellent. What I'm going to do is, with each guiding question, I'm going to uh, you know, read it out and then ask my librarian to kind of start the conversation and uh, go with them first. So our first question is, what are some of the long-term impacts on teaching and learning um, in our libraries due to the lockdowns? And basically what this question is asking is, well, actually I'll let Angela kind of jump in with this question because it was really kind of something near and dear to her heart. Angela, go ahead. Yep, sorry, I was just trying to unmute. So this is, I, I was thinking about this in terms of, I'm the elementary librarian and so my, my role has significantly changed as all of ours probably have, but I guess I was thinking like, what, what have we learned from this experience that will, when we go back to school, how will what we have learned through teaching distance learning and teaching from home, how will that impact our teaching in school, in person again? Um, what will we take from this experience and apply to in-person lessons because, yeah, we can go back to the same thing that we were doing before, but how can we use what we've learned from distance learning and apply it to what we're doing with our, with our students in person? Um, I know the way our library looks um, and the way things will be um, will change, and I think we're going to discuss that later as well, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about what how you guys all see. Um, I don't know if any of you are back to school already um, and maybe could talk about some of your experiences going from distance learning to back in the classroom um, and what that looks like. 
Anybody want to start first? Kim, let's hear from you. Is there a special way to raise a hand in Zoom? Oh, like sure. In, you know, how do I do that? I know yeah. how to do that in Meet. Uh, yeah, in Zoom, uh, good question. In Zoom, you click on participants, and then yeah. at the bottom, there's a little thing that says raise hand. Excellent. OK, so um, clearly, I haven't been in very um, innovative Zoom sessions yet till now. OK. What um, the ISA libraries opened, um, the lower school due to, um, first of all, I'm in the Netherlands. I'm at the International School of Amsterdam. Um, the Dutch government has um, taken on an intelligent lockdown position on COVID-19, <clears throat> which meant that they um, rolled out returns to school for lower school students first, that is students from nursery up into grade five. Um, within classrooms, there was no expectation of social distancing, but there would be social distancing between adults. So that meant that students would come back, they would return to school, they were given that option. Distance learning would continue and teachers were given the option to return to school or not. So teachers would partner. Um, one would be teaching distance learning and then one would be on campus. Um, the cohort of students that are in the classrooms on campus, some with teaching assistants, some with technology facilitators, um, uh, some with classroom um, uh, library assistants, um, it depended on who was able to return due to their personal situation. Um, and so library services, we had to negotiate library services. Um, we uh, went in a vertical start to a fully developed overdrive service, a digital library service, which was not in place prior to March 15th. It is now. Um, it is. Uh, uh, we went for a fully developed library website, um, the Library Guides um, platform, SpringShare, and that was not in place before, but it is now. Um, and a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, working with kids, um, class Google Classroom or Google School, and there were Google Classroom activities and interactions for our lower school librarians. Um, I joined Google Classrooms as the upper school librarian, so that's grades 6 through 12 in our configuration. So I would join MYP and DP classes. I have one-on-one -on -one extended essay sessions with students, and we are returning to school this week, upper school, for uh, I guess it's three weeks, but maybe 12 days of actual instructional days. And what I want to keep from all of this is the flexibility that virtual meetings, virtual um, classes, virtual uh, um, connectivity can make the most of space, um, time, and this idea that you have to, um, as, as, a, as a subject that's near and dear to my heart, um, taking some language from the ideal libraries document, the IB, um, that the library devoid of inquiry, action, and reflection is just a space. Um, perhaps some of this um, digital distance learning um, management could be used to make sure that the library as a physical space is more prioritized as an inquiry, action, and reflection space for students. So. That's what I see, as well as having library resources dedicated to parents. And I think that the parent pieces of this have become incredibly clear to us, and I'm going to shut up now. So <laughs> there you go. No, no that was uh, great feedback. I like that idea of flexibility. I think um, that's a, in a lot of the conversations is this idea of trying to be flexible when we go back to school because students and teachers have been so appreciative that their time is a little more flexible. They are able to do the same amount, but with the flexibility added on has been a huge piece. And usually we're very strict about time and schedules and uh, maybe there'll be a lot more 
interesting conversations about that moving back. Um, who else would like to talk about what, how they're maybe teaching library sciences when they go back to school might change because of COVID and distance learning? Larry, what do you think? Well, I think we're pretty much following the guidelines of the UK in terms of having an, an opening phase of the library when the kids come back in September. We're beyond being just a depository of books. The library won't um, be much else in that first phase. <clears throat> so we just work out the logistics. I mean, the Netherlands was smart to get everybody there, work out logistics and then go back for vacation and come back in September. Um, but we're going to be starting back in September. Those who know me know I'm retiring at the end of this month. I wish I would have retired in January rather than end of the school year. <laughs> would have been a much easier job. But that said, I'm trying to leave everything ready for the, what's going to be coming up for next year. We have an old library. It's like 30 years old and, and it's really not been weeded very much. And I'm hoping that this was going to be the opportunity when it will become just pretty much the depository of books that will take at least a third of our materials and put them into classrooms. So the kids, even though the library space is closed, we will beef up the classroom libraries by five, 600 volumes in each room. And that then will help the weeding process. Which ones do we bring back if we do and help us to maybe rebuild a library with the appropriate materials, not the things that have sat there for 10 years and just have collected dust. I think we were caught short. We had no e-platform at all. Um, previous administration had been pretty much against that. And I think they see now that um, there's a real need for it. And I hope that moving forward, at least a third of our collection will be on an e-platform, if not more. And this, those are some of the things I, I look at in, in, in coming up. Um, we have the problem of the, the quarantine of books coming back for 72 hours. Um, all, all of those logistics yet to be worked out. I'm hoping that we can get, you know, library assistance in each room that will be able to do a check in, check out from those library books that are in the classroom library. Otherwise, we'll just have to maybe in January try to regroup and see where we are. But they might have to bring you out of retirement. Well, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm going to run to the hills. I'll hide out <laughs> in the Dolomites. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Tara, you have your hand up. Okay, I really did hit my space bar and then it just it had a bell instead. Um, okay, when I'm thinking about what I would bring back to the library after being at home, uh, I feel really fortunate that we had Overdrive or Sora for the younger kids. I'm the elementary librarian, but the elementary kids were not really using Sora all that much. It was like the last alternative, which I get because of uh, most kids do want a paper book. But I feel like Sora's had this beautiful like moment in time at our school. And we've really spent like a big portion of the rest of our budget on Sora. But um, I think all of us have lots of great subscription sites at our school and I would be promoting them to teachers and, and a lot of times people just didn't use them. And so that I think is a really, really nice thing. Like Epic is something that we're using extensively. Now the classes have their own, the teachers are assigning books, I'm making collections, like all the things that I was talking about that are really great. I feel like people really now are saying, oh, they are really great. So I'm hoping that we have more of a hybrid, I guess. So still obviously nonfiction um, print books as well, but I feel like nonfiction especially has been great online for kids. Um, that's one thing that I, I'd, I'd like to keep. Um, and then the other one is um, kind of how to direct kids within those subscriptions. So I've been doing a lot of virtual library stuff each week with the kids because our job as specialists is we post two activities a week on Seesaw for the kids. And so I started um, doing this virtual library. I know Angela, you did one too, and there may be others. They're really, really fun with the Bitmojis. And it's helping me because when I send kids to Epic, they just get, they get lost. There's so much fun stuff on there. So this just guides them. So I usually put three books and then I hide four learning videos somewhere in the slide and they just dig it. So I'm hoping to bring that kind of more choice 
back into the library when we get back as well. Um, we are back in Prague, but in a kind of a different way. It's called a partial reopening. So we were still doing distance learning. And then we had about a third of our elementary optionally come back and we are, we have aides and specialists on site just facilitating. That's it. We just make sure they're on their Zooms at the right time. So it'll be, I'm really interested to see what other people say about what, what library will look like. Like, is it going to be that, that we're in the library and people are touching books because we we're just starting to get the books back and it feels overwhelming. So maybe we'll touch on that as well. Definitely. That's actually, I think, our third, third guiding question today. So I think that'll be great. Um, let's hear from Barbara, because I think, uh, Barbara, you had your hand up, and then we'll have Stephanie. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's, first, it's really nice to see a lot of you, most all of you. Um, I follow many of you on Twitter, so it's nice to see your faces um, uh, for once. Um, we uh, had our last day of school yesterday, so we're done. Uh, we did 10 weeks um, of online learning, and we're not sure what's going to happen in the fall um, when we... Uh, uh, go back if it'll be virtual or or on campus or a hybrid. Um, I identified a lot with what Tara was saying um, with Sora and Overdrive. We also were quite lucky when I arrived in August. Those are the first two things that I kind of got going was our LibGuide and, and Sora. So the kids knew it but it was still relatively new um, when we broke um, and yeah the use as you would imagine just went through the roof. Um, um, and so there was a lot of kids reading for pleasure um, our kids had a great um, selection of books to choose from, um, from grade through all the way to grade 12. Um, our teachers had a lot of good books to choose from um, as well. Um, so I was really happy with that and I wanna keep that going as well, um, as Tara said. Um, but something else that I thought was good for me, I teach three through five in the ES and I also teach six through eight in the middle school. And I get a lot of face time with the elementary kids in normal times um, and a bit less with the middle school kids. Um, my schedule is completely flexible with all the grade levels um, in real life, uh, and I kept that up for online learning as well, integrating with units, but admin also required, um, I'm not really a specialist, I'm not considered a specialist, but uh, I was kind of lumped in with everyone uh, for this requirement um, to do six optional open sessions per week. Um, and so they were just whatever I wanted to do, optional things for kids to join in, whoever wanted to join in could. could. And I assumed that for elementary school, it'd be great. And a lot of kids came every single week and I, that wasn't really a surprise, but the middle school kids surprised me. A lot of them joined, way more than I thought uh, would. Um, and so that's something that I hadn't tapped into quite yet. Uh, I've only been here since August, but I, it kind of taught me that I wanna keep that going. Like I wanna go back eventually and um, offer more things like this to my middle schoolers um, to continue to keep them involved. So I think those two things, um, keeping Sora and the LibGuide, keeping those growing and uh, getting more face time and giving more options to my middle schoolers. I think I wanna keep going as we go forward. Excellent, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Stephanie. I'm at Bavarian International School. I'm the primary school librarian. Uh, we are back on campus, all grades, but we're rotating who's physically, which grade is in. Um, so it's a hybrid model. Uh, so for example, three grades are on campus this week and then we'll rotate three more grades next week. And the kids are bringing back the books that they've had in their homes for nine weeks, um, but I'm not allowed to check anything new out. And I'm noticing and I'm concerned about for the fall, the physical touch of books and reading material. Um, it's been a struggle to find age appropriate reading research material, especially for exhibition completely digital for the last nine weeks. And I miss being able to go to my print resources and give them a whole host of books about landforms at their reading level that they can touch, that we can make copies and they can physically write on and annotate. Um, and so, I, yes, there's amazing things with all this digital stuff, but I'm very concerned about the actual touch of books and being able to interact with the paper version of it. It is not the same to annotate a website it's not the same to even read a website uh, than it is to, to read that same information in a book. So anyway, that's my, what did I learn from all of this? Yeah, that's great. We actually, our next guiding question is actually focused around that idea of the difference between digital and physical and, and what the impact of that is gonna be on the future. Um, let's hear from Pam and Elizabeth and then I think we'll, we'll jump to that next question. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I guess for me, one of the really positive things that's come out of this is that for such a long time, I still have a few teachers, I'm in the primary school, who really do see my role as being take the kids into the library, read them a story, let them check out new books, that's, you're done. And through this, I've really been able to, to push this idea of let me help you resource your units, even if it's online. So I have all sorts of teachers coming and saying, I don't know if this is part of your role, but these kids are really interested in this and I don't know where to get resources, can you help? So I've been putting together loads of resource lists and since Destiny opened up their collections as well, I've been, you know, stealing all of those and creating collections for all of our units. And it's been really, really fantastic that teachers are actually seeing now that that is part of how I can and do support them. And so hopefully when we go back, they will continue to use me in that way as well and not just see me as that person who sits behind the desk and checks out books. Yeah, that, that's, uh, if not the librarian, who? Like, <laughs> it's good to exactly. use, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad their answer wasn't used, tell them to use Google, so. Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi, I'm a little bit different from most of you. I'm um, a ninth through 12th grade librarian. I'm director of a library, educational technology. I run the iLab, I coach robotics in here and that kind of thing. So much of my energy since we closed March 4th has been shifted to the ed tech director. Um, and I'm also the EE coordinator. So we have, uh, we're a small school, we have 300 students. Um, everyone Does anyone is, else work there? Huh? Does anyone else work at the school? Is it just you? I'm also school? boarding faculty, so I live here. I'm in the school. Um, so tomorrow I, I go, open, you know, tape together boxes so that we can pack up borders things and find the art in the art room and, you know, all that stuff. Um, I've, I'm the complete opposite of you. I would kill if my kids would read for pleasure. They hit 11th grade and everything is the IB. Um, I feel really fortunate that we had we were already a Google Classroom school for years. Um, I've been trying to push us into a, a proper LMS, but there's a lot of resistance uh, because we use a, a, a bad SIS um, and we need somebody to retire before that changes, um, which is fine. Um, we've always had resources online. We subscribe to a ton of databases and we have lots of research available. But one of the shifts that we've made, which I have been looking to do for a while, is um, we pushed our EE into junior spring. So the kids had literally just started about three weeks before we shut down. And we have actually been able to get EEs from, I'd say half of our juniors at this point. The final is due next Monday, we'll see how we do. Um, much of my time is spent finding resources for teachers. I'm shopping databases right now. Um, I, Infobase right now is pushing subject specific if you need things um, at a really nice discount. Um, but it's, we're all exhausted. We're just, we're just so tired. And I think a lot of it is right now we're headed into this big PD thing for three days and we've created a whole website for it. It's all about blended learning. Um, we're a very small building, so we have space issues and the library will definitely be taken as a space and turned into classrooms. So I'm looking at plastic sheeting over the books so that we can still con continue on a weekly basis to distribute books on, on an email request through Follette. Um, we're bringing in SOAR, we've not used it before. I'm actually really interested in audiobooks instead of eBooks because I wanna get our kids eyes off the screen every once in a while. Um, and that, that's kind of it. It's a, it's a really busy and interesting time. As an ed tech person, I'm really interested in how we can keep moving blended learning forward in a really productive way, so. Excellent, sounds like you have a pretty amazing job there. I'm sure it keeps you busy. It's, I actually, I love it. It's, I would be so bored if I wasn't doing everything that I do. <laughs> I, I miss our kids so much. I live in the building and they're not here in the hallways with us. We have 47 boarders who are now in 15 time zones. So wow. it's, it's been interesting. Excellent. Well, I'm so excited by your answers because you're tying in nicely to the other guiding questions that we have. So I'm going to actually, uh, looking at the time, throw up the next one for everybody. And it is uh, kind of focusing on what Stephanie was mentioning. So with such a focus on digital books and content during distance learning, what considerations are being made for the balance in the future? And especially with all those considerations, you know, we talked about um, the kids' screen time as well. We, we push them under a screen almost eight or nine hours a day asking them to read books digitally. Um, how are we gonna take that in mind when next year teachers might still want them to, to have these eBooks and use those eBooks? And what are your thoughts for libraries and this balance between 
digital content and e-content. And I want to start with Robin here and get, what, ask what her thoughts are. Spacebar didn't work. There, there you go. <laughs> didn't work for me. Um, I'm Robin. I am the upper school librarian at the American School of Milan. And thinking about a balance in my collection is something I've been thinking about for about a year now. Um, I'm finishing up my second year at the American School. Um, in year one, it was my plan to just sort of observe nonfiction and watch how the students and the teachers used it. Um, it was a very full collection that just visually I could tell without even looking at a report, a shelf list that a lot of things needed to be weeded, but I wanted to, to watch the collection first. And then at the beginning of this year in the fall, I did a major weeding of our nonfiction and probably discarded half of our nonfiction collection. And through the process as I was removing more and more, um, kept asking myself, how do I want to replenish or replace my nonfiction? How do I want to rebuild this? Do I want to just add in more print resources? Do I want to use this as an opportunity to purchase more digital resources, more databases, more electronic um, reference? um books and now we're sort of forced into it and um i've already kind of had in the works over the last several months even before uh we started our closure in february was to maybe streamline our databases get some more that were um more appropriate and available to more grade levels, um, get rid of, or I guess, uh, yeah, replace things that were kind of doing the same thing and use that money to go towards um, other databases. So I'm already in the process and that will continue um, probably over the next nine months as subscriptions end and new ones um, begin. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out what, how I'm going to build up my nonfiction, but it's something that I've already been thinking about before um, our closure. Do you think if the kids came back to school as normal that they would stay on the current track of using digital material? Do you think they'll go back to wanting to have that physical material in their hand? Um, when I think of uh, nonfiction and research, I think, and, and looking at our numbers and reports of database usage, that um, they'll stick with using those um, databases and electronic resources. I think for nonfiction and independent reading, it's going to be a mix as we're still promoting for our middle school and our high schoolers um, Sora and ebooks and audiobooks. Um, I think that will still be probably a nice uh, balance of use as well as um, kind of purchases and offerings. Great. Who else would like to discuss about this idea between print, print books, ebooks, audiobooks? and how that might look when they come back to school or that pattern. Yes, Pam. Uh, just very quickly, I think being in primary, uh, I did a survey a few years ago about how many kids were interested in eBooks and I was really, really low. And the amount of parents I've had messaging me over the last 10 weeks saying, can we get library books? Can we borrow books for the summer? Where can we access physical books? You know, we don't want to be on the Kindle. So I'd, I'm torn because I know that the, the physical books in the primary library are really, really, really um, loved and well used. But when you just don't know how much you're going to be in school and how much they can be used, do I allocate more of my budget to the e-resources and cut down on my physical books? Or 
do I hope that at some point it will go back to normal borrowing limits and, and ways and, and keep resourcing with, with new physical books. But I know that the kids are, are, you know, especially fiction, really, really crying out for the physical books. That's, that's you know, a huge request that I've had. So, yeah. Uh, Judith? Yes, um, I think it was Robin, you were talking about this idea of balance. And I think that's really the key. I mean, one of the amazing things I was, um, you probably experienced it as well, just this overwhelming amount of resources that suddenly became available and it was like resource overload. And I think, you know, the key part of our job is the curation part and making sure, I mean, having lots and lots and lots of databases means nothing if our kids can't understand them, if it's not easy for them to access, if it's not the information that they're needing or looking for. So I think, you know, each of us, all, all, our, I'm a primary school librarian, um, early years through grade five, and I think we know our clientele and what their reading needs are and what their research needs are. I do think that this, um, I was, if there's a, you know, a great thing about this situation is the fact that now everyone is on the library website. They can log into everything. They use everything. They can cite everything. So that's been great. I mean, in a way, we've been kind of ready for this for quite some time um, with our systems in place. Um, but I do agree with um, Pam, it was what you were saying. Even with nonfiction books, I mean, they've loved Pebble Go, they've loved Brain Pop. You know, those are kind of our, the heart of our um, databases for primary. But even then, they want to walk around with that book of spiders and pour over those pictures. And you just, you know, it's that kinesthetic thing that you just can't get from a database. And I don't care how cool it is. You can even send them to the San Diego Zoo, that, you know, virtual field trip. They still want to hold on to that book. So I think the key is, is just knowing who we're serving, knowing what they are craving, and making sure that we have the balance that they get what they need in whatever format they need. Now, there are some kids who have just flown digitally. I mean, kids, and it's interesting, some of our, our students who really struggle um, in terms of behavior and such, this was such a freeing moment for them. They didn't have to sit quietly in class. They could pursue the, you know, whatever they wanted to pursue and in the way that they wanted to. So it, this was, I mean, I think th for all of us, this was such a powerful experience and scary and still we don't know what the future holds. But I, I think if nothing else, this really clarified to me how important um, the curation part of our role is. Excellent, thank you, Judith. So L L it says Lillian's phone, so I'm hoping your name is Lillian. Forgive me if your name is not Lillian. Ah, Liliana. Ah, okay. Sorry. Hi, Go ahead. I'm Liliana. I'm, I'm working at Singapore International School in Mumbai, India. And uh, I would like to share what we are doing. Uh, I totally agree with what she just said because this is a moment in which we are facing uh, different challenges. No, uh, for me, as an example, I'm the head of the library and I have uh, my kids. Most of the time I'm working with PYP. I also help with diploma students, but most of the time I'm focused on PYP. And you'll see now my role is changing. I'm doing like a tech, I'm like a tech coach to the teachers. And also teachers, as the same way kids are learning to use more resources online, here in India, the government, with the, when they close everything, they also, they didn't allow bookstores to sell books online. And kids, they love, in my school, they love to read so much printed resources. I was uh, showing them all the online databases for the little ones and all for the big ones. We had Epic, we have Brain Pop. They like it, but they didn't use it the way they are using it now. Because now they feel the need. And the kids, they cannot have that variety of books, printed resources at home. So Epic is rocking 
nowadays because they all have access I'm helping them to discover different tools and we are planning with the teachers some activities. I'm co-teaching with the teachers and we are planning activities in which they are in charge. Hmm. So they it so they feel confident and they feel that they are in charge of the activity, they are creating things, they are doing things, they are producing things based on whatever they are discovering and reading there, related to the unit. So I think that we are going in the future when this finish, I don't know if this is going to finish, but in one moment we are going to be blended the same way that we are going to continue teaching because the school is closed. We are teaching all from home through Google Classroom and CISO. So I suppose that in some time we are going to reopen on July, we are going to have only 15 days of holidays because you know very well that the main problem that we are facing are the curriculum. The IB curriculum is not designed, it has not been designed to be taught online. And the school is very concerned with all the diploma students. So they are going to reopen instead of in August, we are going to reopen in July online. Wow. And we don't know when we are going to come back to the campus. Wow. So I think that we are going to go for middle school and high school. I'm sure that audio books are rocking and also online databases, but I'm working very hard with teachers. No, because for some of them, not everybody has the same. Uh, is so used to online resources on reading online or using different tools not to show the understanding not as an example now teachers are so happy using flipgrid as a tool for reflection because on or the language teachers no they are loving it so much because it's allowing kids to express and all the preparation that they have to do to express their ideas so let's see how it goes yeah, no, I, I love it. I love how a lot of these, a lot of teachers were kind of forced into uncomfortable situations because of uh, COVID and it, it forced them to be Actually. innovative. And you're, sometimes you're like, why did it take a pandemic to get here? We, we, we showed you these tools before, but, and it, you know, I like to say innovative is being, how can you be innovative inside the box? So COVID forced them inside a box and they had to be innovative being restrictive. And it's been really cool and amazing to see what teachers and students have been able to do because they were restricted and then all these other new worlds kind of opened up for them. Um, it's just been amazing. And I think the librarians have been, uh, had a central and key role into guiding people into the right directions there. It's a very great point. Exactly. And especially being an IV educator, you have to think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when people, they are too long teaching the same subjects, they are building their own boxes. Yes, that's a whole other virtual thread we can have a discussion on. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Does anybody else want to, um, I think our next question is really going to get to the heart of uh, uh, what we're thinking about here. So does anybody have any, any other um, thing they want to add to this question? Excellent. I will share the, the next question then. And it's how are schools physically adapting to accommodate regulations? So basically, like we were saying before, we were talking about how, you know, the library is the heart of the school. When I walk through the American School Milan and the library is physically in the middle and there are students there all, almost all day, uh, engaging with each other, they're playing chess, they're learning, they're taking out books, they're reading, they're listening with friends. It's just a place where our students come and engage with each other. And we're just worried this heart of the school where our, our kids are so engaged um, just might not be the same when we come back due to physical restrictions. So we're really kind of interested to hear from other schools, maybe schools that have opened, schools that um, are uh, thinking about this next year on what they are going to do to try and make sure they're applying to all the rules, but actually come back and use the library the same way they have in the past. And I'm going to open this up to the field who'd ever like to speak first, or if anybody has, any, has the same concern and just wants to expand on the question. 
Angela, go ahead. Can I touch on it a little, Stephen? Mm -hmm. I'm curious. So I run a semi-flex schedule. And so I have a fixed EC through second grade um, schedule and then three through five is flex. Um, and I just, I know that, I mean, we don't know all of the regulations that we'll have come September, but there's talks of, you know, the possibility of 10 students per, per class. Well, if we currently have 20 students in every class and we have 22 classes, I mean, that's 44 classes. There is no longer a flex schedule if people are coming to check out books and use the library. So I know that's going to, I know we're going to have to be creative with one, how we use the space and two, what our schedules look like. And, and that goes back to that, you know, flexibility piece at the beginning and thinking, I guess, innovatively about how and what we can do um, and even how our, how that'll change our practice. Um, you know, for the better too. Um, but also the, the physical pieces, how do, how do we have kids come for checkout? Can we have kids come for checkout? Can they be browsing books? I mean, in my story corner, I have reading buddies, which are stuffed animals. Like, will all those have to be put away? Will our games have to be put away? Um, so, so yeah, I'm, uh, we're thinking about all of those little pieces and then when you when you take all of that away, what's what's left? Um, I I can say something to this. I um as I said, I probably am going to lose my space. Um, I can't have kids with their hands in the Legos and the iLab either. So I've shifted all of my curriculum. Um, I teach Python. And um, I have a robotics course that we're gonna do AI and Arduino instead, and I can ship little Arduino packages out to kids. But when it comes to the library, um, the idea of books being covered by plastic is so alien, right? It's the best thing that we can think of to somehow protect people from wanting to touch them because they constantly want to touch them. Um, but it means that we have to do it in a way that the librarians can lift plastic and reach into the shelves and get things. Um, we can't, we can't have our cup of pencils on the desk. We can't give out rulers and protractors and calculators. We can't loan out Chromebooks for the kid whose computers crashed. We're a one-to-one -one laptop school. Bring your own choice. Um, I gave a list to my head of school a couple of days ago, and I said, this is what my expectations would be in the library. And have we thought about the computer? We have the only computers um, that students can access in school because we have the only printer that they can print from, but they have printing limitations. I've just said, yank out the computers, the printer, the comfy chairs, put them up in the attic because they're just not healthy. They're not good for this, you know, for the kids to be in. And we're gonna have to have them in very regimented areas. You know, like when you get on here in Italy, when you get on a bus, there's you know, a piece of paper taped to every other seat that tells you where you're allowed to sit and where you're not. The idea of kids being in masks. How is a language teacher gonna deal with students in masks, right? And I, I mean, we're lucky that we have teenagers. I can't imagine you know, eight-year-olds not being able to play on the playground if they want to. So to me, I think that the library will always continue to be that social hub in limited numbers, but it will still be the heart of the school. And we just have to find ways to reassure the kids that, that that's okay. It looks different, it feels different, but it's still also the intellectual curiosity center, right? And if we can find physical ways to remind them that even if they're in a database, they're still in a library resource. They're still looking at information and evaluating it and using all those skills that we've been teaching them over the years. So I cling to that rather desperately. That's great. I think I'm going to petition my director to change the name of the library to Intellectual Curiosity Center. I think it's a great name. Um, Kim, you had your hand up. And I'm unmuting. Um, we have um, been circulating print materials in our lower school. I, I also serve as head of libraries for, I'm the upper school librarian. So MYP and DP. Um, our PYP um, colleagues have been collecting materials to use in their isolated classrooms. Um, we have boxes for returns, and this of course is per Dutch government, uh, the, the Dutch government's uh, regulations that they open the lower schools and the younger children from nursery age grade five or under 12 are allowed to be together without an issue. 
so they do not have to um, social distance. Um, they are not allowed, though, to leave their classrooms. So the librarians, every day, they come and we have these wonderful Follette, the massive nonfiction boxes that I stockpile, as we all do. We hide them from people very often. So people want our boxes and they're not allowed to have them. Um, but so they were there, they collect the books. And for a while, they were in 72 hour quarantine due to the fact that most of them were plastic wrapped. Um, the research that continues to be updated is that the, the possibility of contracting coronavirus from um, surfaces is very low. Um, from paper, on the inside of a book very quickly dissipates. It's not, that's not a concern and the plastic wrapped or the, uh, um, the hardcover books um, we let sit for uh, 72 hours. And then they are either shelved or they can be checked out by students. We have used Google Forms for students to ask for um, the librarian who know, we know them very well in the lower school. They will choose books for kids and send them home. Um, and we are now starting, getting ready to start a curbside pickup for the children and families who are still distance learning. So they will fill in the form and then our library um, staffs will collect the books and they will bring them to a drop off point. Parents are not allowed on campus in any way. So they come to a like a service door to the side and um, they, they can be handed the books and we can have books returned into a box and then the boxes are set aside right now for three days still, even though it's not sure that they need to be for 72 hours, but we do anyway. And then next week on Monday, when I return to the upper school, the middle school, high school library, um, we are going to start um, re having books returned and we are going to start uh, circulating books as well. Right now, we're deciding how that's, what that's going to look like. Um, my, my colleagues and my students are begging for um, print books. And um, all the research that's, that's out there um, is that print books um, are a student's preferred way to read um, for deep reading and for contextual um, and uh, understanding subject specific understanding um, and all the other benefits of print um, which is um, empathy and um, because it's deeper reading um, what we're looking for is that balance what um, Elizabeth was talking about what all of us are, are, are concerned about um, is the balance between the print which brings in the deeper reading and the more inference and the more um, uh, critical thinking skills, and then the digital, which is um, a still very, very quick reading. Um, for example, my son read 14 graphic novels yesterday on Sora and got locked out um, because you're not allowed to read that many books and return them as rapidly as he did. We had another little boy um, read all of the Fly Guys in one day um, which there are like 4,000 of them, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there are, there are too many fly guys, way too many. And he got locked out. And, and then the, you can't get back into Sora. But I know for a fact, my son, 14 graphic novels, even it's, he's, he's, he's going like this, right? When he has the print, it's a lingering, it's a, it's a richer experience for him. Is one better than the other? It depends, right? And so that's what I think that we're, um, the great gift of this is that we are going to have students uh, and building readers that are going to be able to what Marianne um, uh, Wolf, who wrote Proust and the Squid and she wrote Reader Come Home, um, said that we are going to have um, students who are developing a biliterate brain, a brain that can, um, benefit from deeper reading experiences in print and can also manage the quicker um, skimming, scanning, and keyword hunting and um, uh, shallower experience with um, digital text. So as, for, as soon as we can, we're getting them the print. Great. Uh, Robin, you have I just want to say to you, Elizabeth, that your comments were reassuring 
about kind of the curiosity center because that's my concern. I'm curious after my upper school students who use it as a social hub, after being away from the library for at least six months, probably 10 months from what we would say pre-COVID normalcy, will they be so far removed from that routine that it's no longer their routine and they've become sort of deprogrammed from wanting to congregate and socialize and be there um, to study or be with their friends? Um, or have we instilled over these years that this is the place that they're welcome to, to come and to be? So that's sort of what I'm wondering what it will be like in another six to eight months in the library for our upper school students. Can I throw something out? We, because we are, we're in, the, we're in the historic center of Rome, like the Colosseum's about a five minute walk from here. Um, the day that they, we went to phase two, there were 22 day students congregating on the sidewalk in front of school. They just, they needed to come together and they needed to come together at school. We constantly get email, when can we come, when can we come? Yeah. And I'm, I'm not worried about that. I think that, I think they're going to be different, but I think that their need to also belong to this community is so strong. Mm -hmm. And we're only with them for, you know, for four years. They're with Larry, most of them for eight. And um, they stay together as, you know, as a, they're, they're a, a pack. Um, but they're smart and they're curious and they're intelligent and they're also driven by the IB. We're hundred percent IB, um, IBDP. Um, I'm not worried about whether they'll show up. I'm worried about how, how we do, how we do that. How do we keep them pushing in the right direction the way that they were on track before? Uh, Kim, you want to add something specific to for Elizabeth? Yes, Elizabeth, you reminded me that I answered, I think the print and digital collection, uh, question when I was supposed to ask about, talk about relationships. And what I meant to say briefly was that um, those relationships are what are driving um, the demands for the print. And we have been able to continue those relationships um, virtually some in for me and for upper school students having one on one extended essay um, meetings in uh, hangouts has been incredibly it's been a gift really because students have sought me out in ways that as a new librarian to them they they maybe wouldn't have necessarily in physically it works for a lot of our students because it is um, not as risky in some ways. So thank you for reminding me I was completely off track before and I'm, I'm done now. There you go. <laughs> no problem. Stephanie, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm gonna combine two things in one as well. Um, if we can get these home libraries sufficient enough to have them have enough reading materials at home, I've seen a glimmer of hope uh, in the kids that have come back in that they're reading more for pleasure during this time period, full stop. Uh, because there's nothing else to do, right? And so if moms and dads can turn off the screen and say read, they are reading more than they would if it was a normal school anyway, um, which studies have shown have, you know, increased their reading skills anyway. There's, there's no reading instruction needed if you can just give a kid pleasure book after pleasure book just to let them grow naturally. Um, and so that makes me think, how can I combine this increase in pleasure reading with the digital um, social, one of the librarians was talking about, she has six segments a week where she offers a check-in time. If we can continue doing that, where they just pop in and talk about the books they're reading, that could be a positive for, for future library use. Excellent, thank you. I'd actually like to hear, John, you're in Luxembourg, since your school is open, what does your library look like right now? Uh, we, our libraries are not allowed to be open by the government, so all libraries are closed in schools. The public library is open, but it's a digital checkout. So our librarians basically have gone with a virtual library. So the libraries are physically open and the kids are using the Destiny wish list 
and hold, and then they create brown bags and they deliver them to the homeroom. And then in the morning, uh, they're dressed up as Harry Potter characters, and we have the security guard with the librarians and they collect all the books. The security guard tapes them, dates them, they bring them up, we quarantine them for three days and then we recycle them. Uh, they are able to go into classrooms because the way it's working is that we can only have uh, 10 kids in one class and they, can never, they cannot interact with other people, but the, the specialist teachers can come into that classroom. So that's how they're doing it. And in the upper school, it's the same thing. We have had various ways with textbook returns, making it fun outside with boxes and both librarians kind of engaging with social distancing. Uh, again, same idea, you, uh, we have Overdrive and many of the online digital services. Our LibGuides was already well uh, you know, visited, but I think it's only increased. I think as many of you have said, everything that was in place has been amplified. And I think what we're hoping is that engagement and excitement about our digital services will continue because we had amazing digital services, but there was reticent and as many, you know, people knew how to log in, but they did. It was just easier to go and ask somebody in the library. And I think we've suddenly seen, especially with our kids grade two through five, amazing amount of traffic in Destiny and Overdrive and the site and parents have really enjoyed the site. So I think we had already a lot in place and now we're really seeing the fruit of the labor. I think the library team's done a phenomenal job and they've really tried to continue that excitement but virtually with the brown bags and teachers the same. Uh, they're quite strict here so all the uh, any common spaces were closed and you can't share materials or anything like that. But the brown bag uh, delivery is very popular and we'll do the same thing. We checked in over 11,000 books. We had two rotations in the lower school and 11,000 books came in and we're going to hopefully check out as many for the summer. So I think even with those restrictions, I, I really hats off to the library team. They've really uh, leveraged what was in place that maybe wasn't used or wasn't as popular and now it's just become kind of the norm and uh, destiny and overdrive and those services it's just interesting talking to people they're like oh of course i go to epic and oh this and that and it was like amazing because we try to convince you for three years that i've been here and you went with reticent and so that's nice i think for our librarians they're just feeling very empowered that all that work that was set up is actually paying off. And I think the balance, as uh, Judith had mentioned and others, is something that we're really going to look at because we have no idea what the fall is going to look like. We're preparing for three scenarios, full online, this hybrid 50% uh, cohort uh, with masks on and social distancing or uh, full on open. So the librarians are kind of mitigating those scenarios and seeing how they can blend that. Excellent. Thank you, John. I was just thinking it, it would be amazing if schools opened in the first day of the library kind of looked like a food store in the first day of lockdown, just completely <laughs> empty shelves. Because <laughs> kids are so hungry <laughs> for, these, for these physical books. That would just be an amazing sight and um, great to see on Instagram. But I'm also looking forward to seeing librarians dressed up like Harry Potter delivering books. Um, so I'm looking for everyone's Instagram account at the end of this just to, to follow you and see those Harry Potter outfits. That would be amazing. Um, Okay, uh, looking at it, we came to the top of the hour, which means now if you have any questions that you would like to pose to the rest of the group, something you've been dying to ask of the librarians, you didn't know how, now is your kind of opportunity to throw a question out to the rest of the group about, um, about lockdown, COVID, or even just about anything about libraries going into the future. Someone must have a question. Okay, great. I, I can ask one about, um, this is an odd one, but periodicals, nobody's read, touched a physical periodical in two, maybe three years now. I finally killed off The Economist because even our econ teachers weren't reading that. Everybody reads magazines online. But how do I, I'm trying to find a platform that will allow me to, to present magazines that doesn't also include all the junky ones, right? Anybody have any clues, any curated? No, but I am trying to do the same thing. I've been thinking about it for 
nine months. Okay. Yep. Nobody reads them. Okay. <laughs> Yet if you took them away, everyone would be like, where'd the magazines go? Where's the rack? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting an increase in requests for my primary library. The teachers want current events. They want the, the comics. They want me to have more periodicals. Wow, that's great. Our kids use them in the elementary library. Yeah. Yeah, things like World Soccer and Matched and um, are, are fought over, basically. Um, and I asked my upper school kids about Thrasher and um, there's um, some really cool um, maker kinds of magazines for, they're really marketed towards uh, teen girls. Um, one of them is called Breathe, I believe, one of the, and there's a Teen Breathe as well um that um yeah and and the make um magazine um these actually have they would be hard i think in the library scenario but they would be i think incredibly popular they have a lot of things you can tear out and make from inside um so yeah it's i love magazines my kids love magazines um but no one wants to read philosophy now you know so um yeah so it's it's definitely something that if you need nonfiction print materials or if you need or you're going to choose between that and overdrive right now i would say is a great time to call um print periodicals and you have a really good reason to do it no one can really argue with you and then start adding them in if if you want to great uh, Judith, do you have a question for the group? Actually, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a question. It, it was a comment. Now I think it kind of went out of my head, but I think it's it's more geared towards what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, I, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm Pollyanna and thinking that yes we're going to deal with this in the fall but this is not the future of library at least god forbid you know i hope it's you know this situation is is not but i think one of the exciting things or are, are, are a big shift for me at least has been um kind of the the agility i found that i i was far more agile and accessible as an online librarian and not just to the students, but to the families as well. Um, and I think that's something that um, I guess it's, if I, if I can take anything away from this is is just that you know the 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 ability, the, the understanding that what we're doing really can connect just beyond the teachers and beyond the kids, but really can go into the families and the communities. And um, I don't know, I was like, I'm, I'm going to mute, pardon me. <laughs> it's been a long week. Oh, I know what I want to say. Okay, so for instance, like I did a book talk, fifth grade book talk, four classes on once on a Google, um, on a Google Meet where they could ask questions. I mean, it was like, whoa, I mean, I felt like, you know, the powerful Oz there, you know, and, and seeing everyone. And I, I really, I'm not sure where this is, you know, that all the lessons and all the things we're experiencing, where it's going to take us in the future. But I would feel that it would be um, certainly opportunity lost if we went back. Not that what we did wasn't fabulous, because we are librarians, but if we didn't move forward in an innovative way that this has, as someone said, forced us to, to work out of the box. It's not a question, is it? I'm going to mute now. No, I just thought it was a great, a great feedback and a kind of wrap up to everything we've been talking tonight. Tara, you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just thinking about that same thing about how like, teachers have learned so much and they've challenged themselves to learn things. But even for me as a librarian, like there are so many new things that I have learned during this time because I don't know, I, I had to be innovative or I had to figure something out or I couldn't go to somebody else like I might do at school. And that's been a real gift. So I want to make sure that and then even offering some of those 
ideas to the kids, like as options, like here's something I learned this week that I thought was really cool. If you want, give it a try. And that whole resilience, persistence thing, not everybody wanted to, but like some kids really latched onto it. So going back again to that, like offering more choice is what I want to do in the library. Like lots of different things that all kind of has the same idea about being in the library, but I've realized too that, um, so here in Prague we do, we meet with every class. So like every specialist meets with every class, we do a Zoom, a 30 minute Zoom each week. And it's kind of up to us what we want to do and it's optional for the kids. So we're actually seeing like the kids who really dig music or really like library, but then the ones who really don't want to be in library and don't want to be in music. So how do we, and then I'm finding